Laura has um, edited a lot of Robert's late work. When did you guys start working together? Late 80s. Yes, okay, so that's a lot of work. And so you had said at one point when we were talking about this movie that it was an extension of the work that you did together. And it feels like it, but I'm wondering how it's different with you in the driver's seat, so, so to speak, as opposed to Robert. Well, it, it was interesting to try to do something that would go with, with his work, but be different and not seem like a copy of his work. But th that's a fine line. So um, I, th I hope I was able to do that. But I think that the interesting thing is that I noticed that the work has uh, changed, you know, through the years. So we had to also change the look of the film to go um, along with that and to kind of drive from one to the other. So that was really fun to do. To change the look of the film according well, to the way the To work. kind of imagine these different textures that, mm -hmm. that would go with the different textures of, I mean, color mixed with black and white, 16 millimeter reversal Bolex, you know, um, the Super 8 um, that he shot. So it was sort of interesting to try to come up with something that would unify it, but yet kind of bend to all those things. Did Robert buy in right from the start? No, and neither did I. I mean, somebody had to convince me to do it. I met somebody who started insisting that I do this film. Right. And I said, no, 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 I work with Robert. You know, I'd feel really weird, you know, doing a film about him. It would be completely different. And I, then I started thinking about it, coming around, and the same thing happened with him. I brought it up to him, and he was like, no, no, no. And then I, you know, dropped it. And then by the end of the conversation, he was like, Come back tomorrow. We'll talk about that. And then, you know, then, like I was leaving, he goes, "Come back tomorrow, really, really." You know, so it was kind of like that. But it's a film that you found before, though, as you went along, and like, you were in the cutting room for a long time at this point. Yes. Yeah. And the thing is that he said, as soon as you know we agreed to the film, he's like, "Oh, come start shooting tomorrow." You know. So I was like, you know, crazy. Like just got you know a crew together and started doing it almost immediately. And I didn't really do a lot of research. So I thought I knew him well enough to do it, but then suddenly it seemed like there were all these things that I needed to know more about. So I kind of did it in the editing room and then kind of went back and shot more. We also had to shoot all the stills and also incorporate all the films and ephemera. So that became, you know, a consideration. It took a while to figure that out, but it was fun to do. I have to say, looking at all the books and sort of decoding the work was really yeah, that's a lot of work. It's very, very dense. And in order to get context, that wasn't giving everything away. Like, I didn't want to give everything away because then it just takes the, the life out of it. But that's also a fine line, to sort of give enough so that people can keep going but not give it all away so that you really work when they see it. Yeah. Very important to me. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for this film. It's for all us older New Yorkers. It's so full of memory. Thank you, uh, Robert. One of the quotes is, "I love mistakes. Sometimes they work out." I wondered how, in this work, that has some meaning. Oh, for me. <laughs> well, one of the biggest mistakes I did was uh, ask some of the questions that that guy did in the film. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And also, you know, to ask about the stones was not a, a big moment, you know, as you can see in the film, but I think it was kind of funny because, you know, it's, it's just a long thing. And Robert actually, um, we started projecting that projection, and I said, oh, let's talk about the stones now. And he sat in front of it and then said, I hate when people shoot stuff like this. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess it's the end of the shoot now. <laughs> but does that mean it's a mistake, or does it just mean that it's something that Robert is reacting to? It's not, a, yeah, I guess it's not necessarily a mistake. It was, it, the whole thing about the film is it was very organic, the way it worked, too. It was sort of like tacking in a sailboat where we kind of went a little ways this way and then we went that way and kind of found our way a little bit. Um, but, yeah, the mistakes were, I, I did start the film without research and then did the research later, so I did ask some questions. And then later on, Robert was like, oh, you're asking better questions now. And I was like, yeah. I, found out those other questions that other people ask you are yeah, your favorite. <laughs> does an editor make mistakes? That question is, does an editor make mistakes? The great thing about, you know, fix it, fix it in the post, you know? That's what everybody always says, but um, as, uh, as you pointed out, it takes longer when you do that. <laughs>
But um, I also think that um, because of the way we shot it, we found, found the film, and it, it just took a bit longer to do that. And I think that it, it was more interesting to do it that way. It was a better process, I think, because we had the luxury of just, you know, not shooting one day if, you know, things didn't work out. I think editors do make mistakes. They do, actually. But you don't. Know. <laughs> shows in different ways. Wait for the mic. There's another answer to that question. There are no mistakes. <laughs> Thank you for the film. Um, what, um, what are your fears when you're making a film like this when you know someone so well and you know um, his quirks and you know his moods, what do you fear? Because you're taking the project and you would like to complete it. When he told you, for instance, we're in the tunnel and then it's going to start. I didn't know which tunnel I was in. I was following you, but I didn't know which tunnel. And I had a fear that I want to stay in the tunnel and not go out into the light. Um, well, the, the biggest fear that I had was that it would turn out to be a film where I was just idolizing Robert, and it was all about Robert the Great Master, you know, and this, you know, grim figure, or, you know, whatever. He, he really doesn't really enjoy being idolized that I know of, and I, that was something I didn't want to do, and that was something I really tried to avoid, so hopefully I did avoid that. Seems like good. But that was my biggest fear, actually. And it's hard enough to, you know, there were a couple times in making this where I started reading the books and I started learning about him, and then I would go to lunch with him and I would kind of like sideways look at him like, oh my God, like, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, stop doing that. <laughs> but the constant, the through line in the movie is him insisting on staying away from definitive judgments, from you know, assessments, from all that stuff that's part of like Portrait's great and, and it's part of who he is and it's something that really, that's present throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. Good, you know, because I think that is that was my fear and I think that's probably I mean I don't want to speak for him, but I'd say that probably is one of the fear that he does have is being idolized or and anytime he does begin to um, be, become idolized, I know he kind of tries to change or something. <laughs> Wait for the mic. Oh, do you have another one? It was really nerve-wracking. Well, the question is, what was it like watching the final, the finished product with Robert? Oh, <laughs> it was pretty nerve-wracking. And I watched it with, uh, I had to set up like a whole little AV, you know, because their basement, you know, I had to bring in the monitor, bring in the speakers and I had to find like an extension cord, you know, there's not that many three prong plugs down there and you know I had to set up this whole little center. Up in Nova Scotia? In New York. Yeah. It was right before they were leaving for Nova Scotia. And of course it, they are they get more phone calls and visitors than anyone I know. So it's sort of like constant phone calls, constantly people trying to come in. So but it was really nerve wracking but I was so happy when they were you know, they were enjoying the film I could tell. And at the end, you know, they said you know, maybe you should show some other people too, you know, but I think it's good. <laughs> so. I want to ask you about, I mean, you know, what's absolutely the most delicate, you know, aspect of making a movie about Robert, which is how to deal with the deaths of his children. And um, that must have, I can imagine that that must have been a really particular or fraught sense of area for you. Yes, I, I really, really worked hard to get that right, and that was, um, that took a long time to edit those sections, because in, you know, in, in, a, in a film of this length to have, you know, so much of that, you know, happen and it, it's just hard to edit, to kind of go in and go out and then still kind of um, have the film show the type of personality that I wanted in Robert. Um, but the other thing too that uh, I really feel like his work is really a lot about his children and, and a lot about how that happened to him and he's very good at showing his innermost feelings in his work so I felt that his work was way a way more you know a better way a more poignant way to show it to portray that and uh, I you know and I think that uh, but even having said that you're, you're constructing something with his work so you know, right. it's still you 
Right, yeah, so I, yeah, I did that. I mean, I tried to, especially with the Pablo, it was a, a, a bit difficult because it was something that happened over a series of so many years. And, um, you know, the other thing with, um, I didn't want the children to just be this issue that came up and then went away. Like, I really wanted them to feel like characters in the film from the beginning. And you got to know them a bit, and, 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 I, and I think that's a more respectful way of doing it. You've got microphones coming from both sides. A real question. Uh, I mean, this film is brilliant, and that you did this is extraordinary. Those of us who know the man through the Americans, which I, I can't tell you how many times in various museums, either in the U.S. or abroad, there will be the entire Americans, there will be some of it, etc. But they're never contextualized, I think, but tell me if I'm wrong, they're never contextualized in his life. One sees the Americans. So we come here today to see the Americans. We begin with the Americans. The rest of this is all unknown to us, where academics were not interested in but am I right that the Americans have so dominated the public vision, view, reputation of him that the rest of this is almost lost? Well, pull my um, days that's or... why I started with the Americans because I wanted to use it as a departure point into the other work and to show that you know he moved on from it. Um, and but then you see in the in the middle of the film where. You know, people don't want to stop talking about the Americans and asking him about the Americans. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I guess I would like for people to be turned on by his other work. I mean, with the scratching on the negatives is such an intense thing to me, I think. And, and to see the videos and, and to see, you know, his polarized and some of his other work, I think it, it's strong and holds up, in my opinion. So I think to use the Americans, and, and I think that this is probably what happened to him too, it enabled him to do all this other stuff. Um, and I'm hoping that it opens the door for other people too, to see his other work. The other thing is that he's, I mean, he's created with the Americans, and then kind of to a certain extent, Paul my Daisy made it off at Wesley, and then two works that are so big and canonical, the film is bigger than him. Right. Like, you know, they've almost taken on as a life of their own, really. Right, it's true. I mean, there was uh, a few years ago the 50th anniversary of the Americans, which was a huge show, and it went everywhere. And it was a huge book. Like, you know, Robert gave me the book, and I had to go leave it at my friend's house because I couldn't carry it. It was so heavy, you know, and it has all the contact sheets and everything in it. And I think it's an amazing. It's a great show. It's a great show. It's a great book. And, those um, contact sheets that we looked at, they're like so huge. It was amazing looking at all of them with Robert. I mean, it went on for two days. I looked at them, so I have like lots and lots of footage that you know, I couldn't fit in the film. It's kind of amazing, so. so um, I, I especially like the music, yeah. and oh, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. I wondered how you uh, arrived at the music and how you worked with Hal Wilner. Oh yeah, he was great. Um, Hal Wilner and Rachel Fox um, came on board and they really made all this music possible um, because original music is really hard to use, especially on a documentary budget, but I kind of felt like I had to have music that stood up to the photographs. And I didn't want anyone to talk over the photographs. I wanted the photographs to kind of come alive. And the way to do that, obviously, is with music. And so um, you can't do that necessarily with score that's all sort of the same. I also wanted to have that very different feeling from one era to the next. So um, they were wonderful to work with. And um, it, it, I didn't necessarily also want every single song to be from that era. I wanted to sort of um, interpret a little bit um, what the pictures or photographs were trying to do, more of the feeling of the photographs. Like I feel like the Velvet Underground over that the early New York photographs has that feeling of New York, you know, rather than being literally from that time. So.
I thought the the music, uh, the energy of the music really captured the real person that we see of Robert because so much of how he's seen by people who look at the Americans is the darkness. And what you brought to life is the person. And I wondered uh, just how willing, he was He was so funny and, uh, and, and, and playful. And how did that work within your structure of the film? Well, I, you know, once you get to know Robert, you, I, I think he, he doesn't open up, obviously, to everybody. But once you get to know him, you realize he's a very, very funny person. And, uh, you know, it, uh, we had so much fun on these shoots when we went on to take photographs. And we went out in the car. It was, at the end of the night, we were all saying, goodbye, goodbye. So at the end of the film, goodbye, you know, because we all had such a good time. So um, I want to to sort of show that, and I do think that any time there is a darkness or a sadness, to have also humor, um, it really helps, and I think it helps to, to have that kind of up and down and that contrast in, in a film. Um, it, it, it gives you more feeling, either way. It's funny, because I talked to Sid Kaplan, you know, the darkened guy, yesterday, and I go, oh, I think maybe I got Robert's sense of humor in the film, and people are liking that, he goes, yeah, it's kind of a dark sense of humor, it's gallows humor, because you know? <laughs> he does have sometimes a very dark sense of humor. Um, but his film scheme, and, his, and, his, and his, it's, I think it's true of his photography too, that it's funny, dark, light, serious, tragic, exultant, all at the same time. That mm -hmm. That's right. what the, um, that kind of homemade feeling is that he's going for, you know, things that are kind of inventing themselves as they go out. Right. Yeah. He, I, one of the quotes that I read recently, which I thought was great, is he said, "It's not the decisive moment. It's not the beginning or the end. It's kind of a middle where I, we're not I'm not sure." <laughs> so it's like a question, which is one of the things I really like about his work. Um, the other thing too is that um, I think that his photographs aren't necessarily what you said, not necessarily dark or light. They're just what it is, you know, and what he's feeling at the time. You know, it, it isn't beautiful, it isn't ugly, it's just what it is. Yeah. I always feel with his photographs that there's the sense that uh, he's erasing something and then recreating it and erasing it again. And I wonder if you felt that and if that influenced perhaps your editing of the film. That's, that's a really interesting thing to say. I, I do feel like that, um, and I do feel that in his work, and that's why I think it was important to have each part of the film be a little bit different. Um, you know, where we start out, like, sort of black and white with the Americans, and then we kind of move into this sort of, like, wacky, you know, 60s, 70s world, you know, and then, and then of course, you know, the later videos in, like, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's important to sort of move forward, I think, and um, don't look back. <laughs> yeah. Wait for the... I don't, I don't know if I missed... Oh, uh, are the distribution plans for the phone? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Definitely. Not, they're not solidified yet, but... <laughs> Are there archival plans for that incredible collection of things? Mm -hmm. I assume you would want to have input in how they're put together. Archival plans for his photographs. For his photographs. And, well. and everything else he has. Well, Robert's work is pretty well spoken it's, for. It's pretty well spoken for. I mean, the great thing is that he donated all of his uh, negatives to the National Gallery. So, uh -huh. um, you know, that's... Uh, not all of his negatives. I shouldn't say all of his negatives. I think up to a certain year he donated the negatives to the National Gallery. So they're, they're uh, you know, for the public to see. And then, uh, I, you know, Pace McGill, his gallery, um, they do a lot of stuff. And we just... Um, I just worked with Steidl, uh, publisher, 
doing a lot of um, his films and videos, and I think a DVD set is going to come out. So the videos are all spoken for, they're, they're preserved, because that's the work that seems very fragile to me. Yes, um, yeah. Shot they're, they're preserved up to a certain point, but as we know, you know, these days it's really hard um, to say that with everything being, you know, digital and virtual mm -hmm. and so, um, so Steidl is going to be putting something out and they're, they are being archived up, up to a certain point, so, and then they're going to have a home, but um, I'm not at liberty to say. And the, um, the rights for Candy Mountain were kind of fuzzy for a while, weren't they? They were fuzzy for a while, but they're owned by Vega Film in Switzerland, and actually we spoke to them, so they were pretty into, the, into putting it in this film, so that's cool. That's fun. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Just wait for the mic. Okay. Uh, no, right here. Throw it. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to clarify, is gonna be publishing them as strips or as a DVD? Uh, DVD. Oh, but also he's you know, he has a whole project with the books, which is um, the, it's called the Robert Frank Project, and so he publishes, well, he's published, I think, all of his back books again, and then also new ones, which there's some really nice new ones as well. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, one more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. one more. Okay, two microphones coming in. Okay. Just a quick thought. You had uh, a section about his father and the house he lived in, and I wondered how you found that. And secondly, um, his, um, well, I'll stay with that. Oh, okay. The, his father, that amazing book of photographs that his father did, w um, was published by Steidl. Um, and, um, it's beautiful. I was kind of amazed that his father was just this amateur photographer and took these great pictures um, and also wrote these little, like the poem that he, uh, that he translates in the, in the film. And I thought of the second question. You had the living theater there in yeah. one section, which is a great group. Yeah. Early theater in New York um, when everything was in despair. I was wondering how much of Beckett he was aware of, and if there were any influences from that kind of playwright. Oh, definitely. Um, the the film Keep Busy had an actor in it that worked a lot with Beckett, and, um, so there was like a crossover there. And uh, also, he he knew Julian. What's his name? Julian uh, Beck. 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 Beck from the Living Theater. I, I, when I first started working with Robert, I put that piece of Super 8 and somebody, he goes, oh, you put my friend Julian in the film. And I went, oh, you know, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was happy to do that. And, and since then, you know, I've read a lot about the living theater. What they did was very interesting. So I, I think things like that in the film, I, I really tried to, you know, include, and then anybody who wants to, you know, gets interested can just look them up and find out about them. You know, there's little references, I think, in different places. Yeah, there's know, a lot places. of points of convergence between Robert and Laura. A lot of other people. people. Yeah, which I think is really interesting. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.